Oh, yeah.
I would ask our audience to rise and to please remain standing for the national anthem and our school song.
Welcome to the commencement exercises for the class of 2023 and the 84th graduation exercises for Hoosanic Valley Regional High School. Thank you to everyone joining us today on this special occasion and for everything that each of you has done to help make this day possible. Yesterday's award ceremonies was a case in point for how fully this community supports its students. We awarded approximately $420,000 in scholarships. Remember that dwarfs the amounts given away by most high schools. I need to take a moment especially to thank our school counseling department and especially Christina Simons and Carol Aragoni for the coordination of that effort. I also need to thank the leadership of the senior class, including class advisor Darren Baer and class president Libby Manages. Additionally, there's always a team of, of staff members whom you may not see on the dais today, but without whom the dais would not be here. I want to especially thank our maintenance staff, particularly Jeff Lloyd and Kevin Wheeler for giving us a place to stand, and Executive Secretary Julie Lang for her meticulous attention to every detail that goes into today's celebration and for giving us her birthday for doing it. <laughs> Somewhere outside of Peru, Illinois, there's a barn. It's just one of those traditional barns, cardinal red, nested beside a silo, like the ones you drew when you were six years old. I remember riding past it on my bike and seeing the triangle as the roof above rows of tasseled corn that were bending toward me in the wind. But this wasn't just any wind. It was an incessant, relentless wind, the kind that leads to madness. Every time I turned a pedal, I moved an inch toward Chicago, while the breeze blew me back toward Iowa. It was 1997, and I was in the middle of a bike trip from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., just a little past the middle of the country. It was a journey of over 3,000 miles that would take me over snow-capped Rocky Mountains, through scenic national forests, and past amber fields of rain. Beautiful scenes, every one of them. And yet, 25 years later, what I recall is just barn, silo, wind-blown corn. It pressed a little. I'll think of the day-long descent from Denver, a push from the Gulf Stream that whisked me along at 30 miles an hour through Nebraska, and the generosity of Iowans, all things that made the journey easier. But those aren't the first things that come to mind. Nope, it's just barns, I love when blow corn. Some days riding through Pantate Flat, Illinois, could feel like climbing the French Alps. The wind would suppress me to a crawl and result in new and inventive forms of, pro of profanity. Other days I would dash along at 25 or 30 miles an hour without even realizing it. Tailwinds can be almost imperceptible. Researchers Shai David I and Thomas Gilbish coined a term for this phenomenon. They called it the headwind tailwind asymmetry. They noticed that people generally tend to notice the challenges in life, the headwinds, far more readily than the advantages, the tailwinds that push us along and make life easier. In seven different studies covering everything from politics to football, people tended to notice the barriers that they had to overcome before they acknowledged the supports that, they, that had helped them along the way. Now recently, Disney Plus presented a major headwind for me. While trying to watch an episode of The Mandalorian, the app on my smartphone, the smart TV, got stuck in a doom cycle, partially loading the show before crashing and rebooting. I had to go through the cycle five or six times before the show finally loaded. It was a true test of my character, and it consumed at least 10 minutes of a valuable weekend. And yet, Within my lifetime, I would have spent as much time scanning the aisles in a video store just picking out something to watch, never mind driving there back. No sooner did we discover streaming video than we discovered the need to curse the heavens for the minor inconveniences it sometimes produces. We agonized over essays, taking for granted spell check that just a generation ago would have required gallons of whiteout. We gripe about the lack of Wi-Fi on planes that magically transport us in the air across distances it would take months to cover by foot. We ruminate over a failed relationship instead of celebrating friends who help us move on from it. But let's test it right here, right now. Everyone, and especially you adults in the back, think of the biggest challenges you had in high school. I'll give you some. Now, maybe you thought of gym class, or a bully named Biff, squeezing in tight jeans. 
Uh, for me, it was Father Borelli, my Latin teacher, who would bop me on the head anytime I got the, 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 the least bit silly. For the class of 2023, it may have been online learning or completing your capstone project. There's probably a temptation for this class to say, this is unfair. No one else had to do this. Why me? Why us? And researchers have found that to be true as well. We are programmed to recall our headwinds far more readily than our tailwinds. And we tend to look for the information that confirms our beliefs about how we have been maligned, that the deck was stacked against us. See, last year's class only had to earn 23 credits to graduate. We're still, researchers find that our tendency to look for facts that support that injustice, also called the confirmation bias, leads us to morally questionable behavior. Because we feel maligned, we also believe it's our right to level a playing field. We feel a need to account for the headwinds that have blown unjustly in our direction. I deserve to be able to use ChatGPT to write my term paper. Look at what the pandemic did to my education. And it's tempting to fall into this trap. Pandemics, global warming, political polarism. When we look for the headwinds that blew against the class of 2023, it isn't hard to come up with them. But scan a little deeper, and you will find tailwinds too. The teacher who asked you how you were doing on the day you weren't doing so well. The parent who was at every home game and brought you to Mickey D's afterwards. Mr. Sheehy, checking in on you every morning to make sure you got to class. The school counselor who helped you find the right college, and the secretary who showed you how to find the scholarship information. So let's take a moment now to think about your tailwinds. Today is a celebration of your accomplishments, but it should also be a day of thanksgiving. Thank the people who helped make today possible for you, who urged you along the road to graduation almost invisibly. As you leave this tent this evening, you will be handed a flower that you should hand to someone you would like to thank for getting you to this stage today. And think more broadly as well. Be grateful for what it means to be alive at this moment in history, when anything our heart desires can show up on our doorstep in a matter of days, maybe even hours. When we can not only talk to, but see our loved ones at any hour of the day, anywhere around the globe. When we can provide free lunches to millions of students and fuel our homes with the power of the sun. Yes, there are more than enough headwinds to slow you down through the rest of your days. But when you spend your days obsessing over them, you'll end up more frustrated than appreciative and more angry than happy. Take time to identify the tailwinds in life that will get you farther, faster. And although you will have to face your share of headwinds, I leave the class of 2023 with the traditional Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you, and may the wind be always at your back. Thank you. At this time, it is my privilege to introduce Region 1 Superintendent of Schools, Lisa Park. Um, I was, I'm so happy to join Ian, the high school staff, the pupil services and central office staff, and the regional board of education in welcoming everyone to the 2023 graduation. Congratulations to you, the graduates, and to your families and friends who are here with you tonight. It's such an exciting time for all of you in so many ways. You'll be happy to know that in the interest of allowing more time for our students and guest speakers, I have chosen not to give a speech this year. <laughs> However, before I turn things back over to Mr. Streamer, I would like to extend these wishes and a bit of advice to each member of the graduating class. Here we go. May your lives be full of wonderment and awe. May your hearts be full of kindness and love towards yourselves. You hear that? Towards yourselves and to others. May you be well, and remember to take good care of your physical and your mental well-being. And may you know that you will be forever loved by all of us in Region 1. Best of luck to all of you in the next, uh, next steps of your life journey. And please, don't forget us to come back and visit us. Thank you, Lisa. At this time, we would like to ask Melody Matigaya 
Sal Salutatory of the class of 2023 to come to the podium for her message to her fellow graduates. family, and friends. I am Melody Montevideo, and it is an honor to address my classmates today. I'd like to talk to you about a hero dear to my heart, my dad, Yoshihiro Matsudaida. I have learned many important lessons from his life. No, I am not talking about how to roll the perfect sushi roll, or the right way to use chopsticks, although those are very important skills. Instead, I want to share with you his life story and hope that it will encourage you as it has me. My dad's story is a story of overcoming adversity. He was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan, and grew up in an impoverished household environment. His father enjoyed vices like drinking and gambling, and was rarely home. My dad remembers when his father took his favorite belongings like his treasured radio that gave him American 80s music, to be pawned for cash to pay his father's debts. He remembers when the Japanese mafia came to his house over and over again, demanding the money his father owed. My dad's parents divorced, which is very rare in Japan. His mom became a single mother and moved with my dad and his little sister into public housing. My dad worked really hard at school and was accepted into one of the top public high schools in Tokyo. Meanwhile, his estranged father had already started a new family. One day, long after my own parents were married, they got news that my dad's father had gotten in a bicycle accident and hospitalized him near death. Instead of ignoring his father, as would have been his right, my dad visited him in the hospital and offered to pray for him and told him how much God cared about him. I want to likewise overcome adversity and forgive others like my dad forgave his father that day. My dad's story is a story of faith. My dad wanted to learn how to speak English, so he attended an international church in Tokyo to practice English with the foreigners there. That's where he met the God of the Bible and where he met my mom. When my dad decided to get baptized as a Christian, his family and college friends did not understand how a Japanese person could reject his own cultural Buddhism and Shintoism. I am proud of my dad because he had the courage to go public with his Christian beliefs even though it meant carving out a completely different path from his family. I want to have the courage to stand up for what I believe no matter the cost. My dad's story is one of family. When it was my dad's turn to become a father, he did not use his own dad's example as an excuse for not facing the challenge of fatherhood. He was committed to be nothing like his own dad, and instead successfully raised six children that I proudly call my family. Always remember that your family's past does not have to define who you are going to be. My dad's story is one of perseverance. When we moved to America, my dad, as an immigrant, went through the long and expensive process of becoming an American citizen. Then he went to graduate school to get his master's degree in social work, and only a year ago, he finally became a licensed clinical social worker. When it seemed that he would finally have the opportunity to open up his own practice, my dad's health started declining. He complained of back pain, but that was after a day felling trees with his chainsaw or after a day helping coach Hoosie Boy soccer. We had no idea until a few months ago that he was suffering with stage four stomach cancer and a separate colon cancer. The cancer caused multiple fractures in his back, neck, ribs, and tumors too numerous to count. The news rocked my dad's life and my family's life. My dad can't work now, can't drive, can't sleep in a normal bed, he has lost 30 pounds since his diagnosis and has shrunk, shrunk four inches. But it's all right, Dad. Now we look a little more related. <laughs> the changes to my dad's life have not beaten him. 
He's been through adversity before. Since his diagnosis, my dad has done several rounds of chemotherapy and radiation, immunotherapy and bone therapy. Despite the immense pain he's been in, my dad manages to cook most of our dinners and has even attended some of our sports games. He tries to deal with his pain by focusing on us instead. He hasn't eaten any granulated sugar for months, has watched his own body shrink and his legs become so weak that he sometimes falls. He is on medication all day, but he has not lost hope. He did not come this far to give up now. Graduates, let's remind ourselves, no matter what challenges we face, we have not come this far to give up. There is always a way out. As our journeys continue after graduation, we will encounter mountains blocking our way in the future. When we feel stuck, we need to remind ourselves what we're made of. We are not soft. We are the only class that suffered through all of COVID and finally had a normal year our senior year. We made it through the crazy and it has made us stronger. Some of you could not play in your senior sports seasons due to injuries. Others of you battle medical issues every single day. And others of you have traveled so far every morning and every afternoon by bus, by car, or by scooter <laughs> to attend school. All those classes you took that you found completely pointless for the real world taught you how to push through hard things and how to push through things you simply don't want to do. Let's make our stories of perseverance. When we're feeling hopeless and discouraged, fall back on these strengths. Overcome adversity through faith, family, and perseverance. Remember this day, this feeling of relief and pride. Remember that you are loved, beautiful, and so worth it. There is not a single other you in this world. Create small goals and don't quit until you make them. A little effort fighting for something small will make us stronger and stronger, so we'll be ready to face real adversity when it comes, just like my dad. I want to leave you classmates with an age-old message that brings me peace and hope. The message that my dad taught me. That a very real God sent his only son, Jesus, to pay the price for our mistakes so that we don't have to. We are people who don't always get it right. We fail over and over again. And who sometimes face insurmountable adversities like stage four cancer. We are not meant to be life alone. We can lean on family and friends, but sometimes they fail us too. But God will never fail us. He can handle our questions, our frustrations, our mistakes, our pain, our cancer, and our futures. We don't have to be really good and work really hard to reach God. He came to us when he was born in a manger. That's the best love story in this world and the greatest message of hope. As the prophet Jeremiah wrote in 600 BC, for I know the plans I have for you, the place of the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and the future. I hope that when you leave this ceremony, you will feel more encouraged and confident. You are my friends and will always have a special place in my heart. You should be incredibly proud of yourselves for all you've accomplished. For many of you, graduating high school is more than just an educational accomplishment. You have been fighting against all odds to get here, and I hope that by the end of the day, you feel noticed and honored. Our world is waiting for each of us to make a lasting impact starting now. Dad, thank you for everything you've done for our family. I love you so much. Congratulations to the class of 2023. Please welcome to the podium our senior class president, Lily Nadejic. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lily Nadejic, the president of the class of 2023. I would like to begin with an apology, because I didn't start writing this speech until three weeks ago. 
There's a plethora of reasons why. The first and most obvious is that I'm a human being, and it is part of our nature to procrastinate. The second, more personal reason, is that I'm afraid to lose the place where I grew up. Every time I sat down to write this speech, I was reminded that it was one of the last things I would be writing as a student at Housatonic. I'm sure that many of you sitting here today are feeling these same feelings. A sense of insecurity over what is to come alongside a readiness to finally move on. Although we are here this evening to take another step towards adulthood, we are also here to celebrate every one of our achievements and how far we all have come throughout these four years. No two students have had the same high school experience. We have each had our own failures, struggles, and accomplishments. As I look at all of you now, I see the people who I've known for most of my life. I see the inseparable bonds we have formed. Even if we only pass each other in the hallway every day and never stop to have a conversation, we are still a part of each other's stories. We all have these people in our lives and these bonds that we created during our time here, whether they came from inside or outside of the classroom. I have witnessed immeasurable growth in myself and others. For instance, Carter Sneller began as a shy boy in my sophomore history class, someone you would be lucky to get a full sentence out of. Today, he is the one that brings energy, humor, and spirit to any situation. Gus Ecker, my best friend, has grown alongside me not just in high school, but for most of my life. I admire not only his amazing personality, but also his consideration of others, trustworthiness, and honesty. Only recently I became friends with Zoe Gillette, but in that little time, she has shown me compassion, friendship, and sympathy. Along with these three people, there are so many others that have taught me so much throughout high school. The fact that we are reaching this milestone as a group proves that our different levels of academic achievement do not alone determine our value. Like me, many of you, I'm sure, have spent time comparing your class level to that of your peers. This did nothing more than stop us from gaining confidence in ourselves. For this reason, learning should be personalized, not collective. The difficulty of your courses and the grades you earn in them is not a full reflection of what you had to offer as a student. We all learn and grow differently. No one's journey is smooth sailing at all times. If you wish you'd study more for that certain exam, or not skip that practice after school, know that none of that matters now. You made it here by pushing through your struggles, whether they were academic or personal. No matter what fallouts or shortcomings you felt you experienced here, you're receiving your diploma today, and that matters most. While many of us are going to college at the end of this summer, others do not know what is in store after the ceremony concludes. Both of these scenarios are okay. Whatever the setting, we will continue to encounter wins and losses. No matter what plan we may have, we can never fully anticipate what will truly happen. It sounds scary, but it can actually be exciting. My hope is that the skills and lessons you have learned during your high school career will carry you to wherever you wish to end up. While this feels like the end of something so familiar, we must look at it as the beginning of something new. This is, after all, a commencement. Whatever may be in store for you next, remember the words of entertainer Sidney Friedman. You can achieve anything you want in life if you have the courage to dream it the intelligence to make a realistic plan, and the will to see that plan through to the end. Thank you to the faculty, staff, and administration who have ensured our success and nurtured our growth. And a special thank you to Mr. Bear, our class advisor, who worked incredibly hard to give us an enjoyable senior year. My congratulations to the class of 2023. Thank you, Libby. At this time, our AFS exchange student, Mumin Ayuba, who has returned to his country, has pre-recorded a speech for us. Ladies and gentlemen, 
is student faculty members, proud parents, and graduates. I said before you today to talk about my experience as an exchange student from the beautiful land of Mozambique. My journey has been filled with challenges and growth. To the class of 2023, I know you may be scared or excited to go to college. Maybe college will be difficult, but remember to stay focused on your goals. It doesn't need to make sense to others. If you're confident about yourself, you will achieve everything. And the same people that say that you won't make it will be clapping for you tomorrow. Let's go back to my experience as an exchange student. My year was amazing. I met a lot of great people along the year. Most of them helped me a lot, like many much better. I remember that he used to be my taxi in my first weeks. I used to call him and say, hey, I'm in this class and I have that class next. Can you take me there? And every single time, he was available. I met most of my friends when I was going to school. The best part of my year was to be part of the sports team and have my own locker. This made me feel like I was a professional athlete. We didn't win a lot of games and I didn't play much, but soccer was amazing. I remember that once we were winning against the school. And then at the end of the game, we all ran to the field. That was an amazing feeling. We forgot everything. We just ran and start, started to hug each other. It seemed that we had won the war. Even the coaches were happy about that. Something that I really enjoyed was the way people support each other. I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't really a supportive person. I used to think that I should not support you because I don't really want you to become better than me. But now, I don't care if you're better than me or not. I will support you and I will try as hard as I can to become a better version of myself. This year taught me a lot. I changed my, my point of views into many things. I have become more self-confident and self-sufficient. I created bonds with so many people that in the beginning I felt it would be hard to create bonds with because we didn't have the same interests or we didn't spend too much time together. One of them was my dad. When I first met him, I was like, no way, I'm going to be calling him dad for a year. But I definitely did a couple of times with him to understand that we both fear the same woman, which is Andrea. <laughs> So my year was, was wonderful and I had the best experience. My year was amazing. I just need to thank Lucy, my host family, and my host community for this amazing year and all of the amazing opportunities that I had along the way. The only thing that I'm afraid of going back home is starting to remember all of the amazing moments because I don't want to forget any part of them. I'm afraid it will start to feel like it was all a dream that I can't remember. Like when you remember that the dream was good, but unfortunately, even if you go back to sleep, you can't continue the same dream. Or even if you can't, it won't be the same experience. For every single person that was part of my year, I thank you because you don't understand how much impact you had in my life. And remember, this isn't a good boy. This is a see you again in another part of the world. Also, I would like to thank my soccer and tennis coaches, 
for always supporting me and encouraging me to be a better player. Thirdly, I would like to thank all the friends that I made through this year for always accepting me, for all the moments we shared together at school, doing the lunches, playing sport together, or outside school. Thank you for all those moments. For us, this is a bittersweet day. For some, the end of high school is sweet. For some of you, this is a bitter day. But let me tell you that for me, it's both. Because I know that during life, you have to end chapters to let other new ones start. And the reason why I'm super happy today is because this chapter of almost 11 months was awesome. Now I'm about to start a new chapter in my life, which I'm looking forward to. But let me tell you all of you that this school, all the teachers, the friends I made here, my host family, and AFS, will always have a place in my heart. This is not a goodbye, but I'll see you later. And if you're in Spain or Barcelona, just tell me, but sometimes we can try to arrange something. <laughs> Thank you again for everything you've done for me. And good luck to all the graduates. I wish you the best in the future. And I love you so much, and I'm going to miss you all. Thank you. Please welcome to the podium our class of 2023 essays, Live Talk. Good evening. Everyone and everything in the universe answers to time. For non sentient beings, time is about more weight. A rock cannot avoid the process of its erosion, but to that rock, the ticking clock is inconsequential. I envy that rock's innate indifference, sometimes. Generally, I view the presence of time not as a blessing, but rather a plague. The idea that each moment I've experienced will never exist again is crushing. Both the happiest and saddest days will disappear, as will the average days which contain small moments that broke up the monotony. The clouds I pulled over to take a picture of on the way home from school were, in that instant, as important as presenting an essay at my high school graduation, yet the specifics of both will blur over time. Then there are those moments that, for one reason or another, pass me by completely. The girl who smiled at me in the hall, though I accidentally ignored, or the color of someone's eyes that I, focused solely on getting through the day, never noticed. The two coexist uneasily. The need to catalog every detail of each moment and the reality that it's simply not possible. The theory of presentism is the idea that time is near. Therefore, experiences exist only in the present. I find myself accepting this philosophy, which essentially contradicts my need to meticulously collect memories, since, if presentism is true, the things I once did no longer exist. Whether I remember and experience or not, it happened. And if that's so, then they still matter. Our inability to immortalize a point in time through memory in no way diminishes its importance in our stories. Growing older is often coupled with a sense of impending due. The recognition that time, which once seemed infinite, is instead running out. The way of all the lives you've not lived have suddenly accumulated, only far too late. The idea that one's growth is capped only by their successes or shortcomings is intuitive though having it stifled by time is devastating. At this point in my life, each year is simply an accumulation of more moments I forgot. <coughs> does not feel I've compiled enough memories for someone who's been alive nearly two decades. My phone is no help in providing accurate documentation of my 18 years of life. Should I take bad pictures of glorious things or hope my mind retains their integrity while I risk forgetting them completely? Mostly, these thoughts occupy my mind during periods of love. But on other occasions, they overwhelm me just as a moment I don't want to forget is unfolding. Each interaction, concert, or birthday is fleeting. An awareness that each interaction, concert, or birthday is fleeting in nature frequently ruins it for me. Because I cannot extract myself from this thinking, I'm left an observer rather than a participant, focused on the idea that this, right now, will never happen again, that everything's both a first and a last. To the point. 
Life is made precious by its fleeting nature. Could every moment be repeated, there would be no reason to seek anything beyond comfort. No thing would be ordinary or novel, heartbreaking or joyous. Could it be relit? Homer wrote, everything is more beautiful because we are doomed. His idea that everything about us, about this world, is precious because of, rather than despite its mortalness, makes life worthwhile. Recognize that which you hold dear. Because to love something fully, you must first fear losing it. I'm delighted to now introduce Rebecca Malone, a proud graduate from Housatonic class of 1999. Rebecca's academic journey has been marked by outstanding achievements, including graduating summa cum laude from Northeastern University with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. For the past 14 years, Rebecca has been diligently serving the Northwest Corner as a board-certified family nurse practitioner. Her commitment to providing exceptional primary care to children and their families has made a significant impact on our community. Rebecca's expertise and compassion have made her a trusted healthcare provider, allowing her to force strong connections with her patients, many of whom are our students. Outside of her professional endeavors, Rebecca resides in Sharon, where she lives on her family farm, alongside her husband, two children, and a loyal town dog. Rebecca's love for the Northwest Corner and her dedica dedication to improving the health and well-being of its residents are evident in her continued presence and commitment to her community. It's our privilege to have Rebecca as part of our community, and it's my distinction to be able to welcome her as our guest speaker. Thank you, Mrs. Carter, Board of Education, Principal Streetwork, family, and friends of our graduates. Okay, I'm really short. Okay. Class of 2023. Wow, look at you. I have known many of you since you were five. Some of your parents when we were five. <laughs> and now every single one of you is taller than me. And that's not hard. Um, and you're off to start amazing new adventures. Thank you for having me here today. It honestly means so much for many, many reasons. First and foremost, I love you. Because like I said, I have had the privilege of knowing many of you through your entire school careers. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I was telling one of my students that you're my kids. And I mean it. That's the really cool thing about being from a small community. We care about each other. We help our friends reach each other's children. If you're here, you are our kids. And we will love and protect you as such. You all matter, even if we have never met. We are family. Secondly, I love Pussy, okay? I went here just a few years ago, class of 99. Um, my mom went to Pussy, my siblings, and my grandma was in the first graduating class of Pussy in 1939. And my son is joining the ranks next year. It's our home. It raised us. And you know we have such a well-rounded well education here. We get college-level academics, world-traveled music groups, small and mighty sports teams, agriculture, tech, art, and so much more. I remember one time, my husband, my husband and I just moved back to Sharon, and he was really excited to be able to use a lawnmower again. And he went to sharpen the blade of this mower, and I yelled up the, map, up the hill, don't forget to balance the blade. And he looked at me completely baffled. What? How do you know about that? Uh, who's he, babe? Lawnmower maintenance freshman here. <laughs> Go, who's he? Be Gilbert. <laughs> I, uh, I hear that we play with them now, but I'm personally having a really hard time adjusting. <laughs> Uh, Coach Bear, did it sing it all for you two? Okay, so, right there. Um, my husband Colin jokes that we have a really weird attachment to our school, and I just think he's jealous that he's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, you guys, you are totally BA, and don't worry, I already know that I am cringe. I have a 12-year-old who doesn't let me forget it, so I own that completely. 
I want to apologize to you right now. From all of the adults, I'm sorry. You, the class of 2023, enter high school, starting to get adjusted, feel like you're becoming part of something new and fresh and completely yours. And then we did the worst thing that you can do to a teenager. We sent you home. We isolated you. When you were supposed to be leaving your family unit and finding your tribe, we sent you to your rooms. And I'm not saying that this was right or wrong. That's not the point of this. But you, you young people, went through something that none of us can understand the gravity of. Because in pretty much any other part of adolescence, we remember and relate to feeling picked on, worried about a test, the stress of a big game, getting a date for the dance, a new job, filling out an application, a scary teacher or coach. But not one adult here, not one parent, grandparent, aunt or uncle can relate to being a teen and being made to stay home. Figure out how to go to school on the computer. No, maybe we'll do chat messages. No, let's do it every other day. Maybe two days off and then two days on. Wait, we'll do it by last name. No, let's try it by class. Your generation, I don't know if it'll be LMN or P or Unicorn or TikTok. You, you know what that's like. Only you. The other, and the other young people who are graduating and moving into adulthood throughout this world right now. And you, you are an amazing lesson to us. You're a lesson of the responsibility of empathy. And everyone talks about being kind, and yes, of course, that is vital. But empathy, empathy is different. Taking the time to try to understand someone else's experience and story because it is not your own. The challenge is not making assumptions, not to say, I know how you feel, but to take a breath and go, I want to meet you where you are. And know that you have an experience that molds your opinions, your anxieties, your confidences, and your fears. They're not mine. They're yours. I cannot and do not own them. Your experience is your story. We cannot change that you graduates did not get a typical high school experience. And instead of telling you how you should be adjusting or how you should be using technology, we can meet you where you are, love you unconditionally, and learn from you. We can hear your frustration, learn about your resilience, try not to make it go away, but hear it and sit with you through it. I call it sitting through fire. I can't make your fire disappear but I will walk with you through it. We have a chance in this ever-changing world to do this for each other. There are so many times that we do not agree with someone, but that doesn't mean that I do not respect them or care about them. We allow them to be who they are and try to meet them where they are in their journey. This is to be human and to care about each other despite not always agreeing with them. We do not have to change people. We just need to respect each other. Understand that our differences, are, our experiences are different, and that's okay. The first few years of our high school experience are only part of your story. Don't make it your entire book. It's a chapter. And the cool thing about the coming years is that you get to start writing even more of your own chapters. Not the ones that we signed you up for. The ones that you get to choose. And some of these are going to end up badly like that. But that's part of becoming who you are. You have to get some scars. We have to learn from our mistakes. They're what create us. I have this really big dent in my forehead, and that doesn't make me who I am, but it is there to remind me that I should not jump head first out of a truck. <laughs> now, we can't write all of our chapters today. We have to wait until we have the experience. We have to experience where and who we are now. You don't have to know who you're going to be when you're 30. You don't have to know who you're going to marry. You don't have to know what you're going to be when you grow up because that changes. You evolve. And part of writing your chapters is being present in the moment. Taking the chance. Going to school. Take the job. Going on that trip. Reading that book. Taking the apprenticeship. Asking the question. We adults have spent the entire year, last year of your life, asking what are you doing next? And not asking, are you enjoying right now? 
Your life is not what you're planning in five years. Your adventure, your chapters of your book are not happening in 10 more years. They're happening right now. I truly believe that it's so important to be here, be in your body, be 17, 18, 19. Don't be 30 yet. Don't be 40. I mean, 40 is kind of awesome, but you don't need to be there before it's your time. Enjoy your moments. Enjoy your people. Make your mistakes. Meet people who disagree with you and be friends with them anyway. Get some scars because you learn from them. Laugh a lot. Ask lots of questions. Be present. Be imperfect. Be yourself. Have empathy. Chin up. Heart out. I love you. Well done. Please welcome the class of 2023 valedictorian, Sylvia, Sylvia Stipp. When I was five years old, thunderstorms, specifically the thunder, scared me. My parents just said it was people in heaven bowling. I believed them because at that age, there was nothing to make me think otherwise. I did not know anything about weather, the atmosphere, or even the earth. Their explanation made me feel better, which was all that was important to me as a child. Eventually, in middle school science class, I learned a broad explanation of what was happening. When lightning strikes, it heats the surrounding air, causes it to expand and contract rapidly, ultimately creating a sound wave that we hear as thunder. Knowing the science behind thunderstorms now doesn't invalidate my belief as a little kid because it was all that I knew and it served its purpose. I was incapable of understanding the larger phenomena and did not have access to the science behind it. In the mid-20th century, the philosophy of positivism became an increasingly popular cultural perspective. Most broadly, it is the idea that we should view the world through the lens of the scientific process. The Italian philosopher Nicola Avignano wrote that the characteristic theses of positivism are that science is the only valid knowledge and facts the only possible objects of knowledge. In the 1950s, this ideology became one of, if not the most, predominant in the United States and the rest of the Western Hemisphere. Much good came of it. The discovery of penicillin, which has since saved hundreds of millions of lives, and the ability to send a man to the moon, which brought citizens of the United States together under the belief that science and engineering could accomplish anything, were achievements both driven by positivism. The historical prevalence of scientific positivism in American society would suggest that our advancement as a country would be driven by knowledge supported by evidence. Combined with immense developments in technology and science overall, many expected the 21st century to be that of unprecedented progress. Instead, our country is polarized to the extent that societal improvement is near impossible. Many factors are contributing to the division of our country, but its root cause is the absent but necessary separation of personal belief from fact. Looking back, I can fully acknowledge that the story my parents told me as a five-year-old was entirely fictional. The scientific explanation behind thunderstorms has been verified by many experts and is not debated. In other words, as is written in 1 Corinthians, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a woman, I put away childish things. Yet, this is not the case for many other topics that are, just like thunderstorms, purely scientific at their core are concerned. The earth is not flat. Climate change is real and dangerous. Vaccines work and do not insert microchips into your body. These are not opinions, but rather statements of fact. 
Therefore, they should no more be a source of division in our country than pointing out that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Since the advent of the internet and the subsequent spread of social media, information of all sorts and qualities has become increasingly accessible to everyone. As the unwillingness to believe science has grown more popular, what began as a beneficial development became harmful. When the distinction between peer-reviewed articles and blog posts is not acknowledged, let alone emphasized, the conflation between fact and opinion begins. Confirmation bias is dangerous, and with unfettered access to both real and fake information on the internet, all too common. Previously, pushback against societally accepted ideas propelled progress in forms such as women's suffrage or the civil rights movement. Now, pushback is directed against historically held ideas that have prevailed because they are supported by data. Questioning, in, questioning authority and societally accepted notions was once seen as admirable for its role in the furthering of our country. But now, it continually results in the preservation of the status quo, and even worse, the regression of society. Ignoring the truth to protect one's own beliefs is naive and irresponsible. Giving facile answers to complex questions is not and never will be enough. Author Isaac Asimov predicted this dichotomy decades ago when he wrote, There is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there has always been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Learn the nuanced and real answers. If you are not willing to do so, please stay out of the discussion. If we lose faith in science, we lose faith in progress. If we lose faith in progress, we will regress. Instead, it is our job to push ever forward, to realize the importance of the scientific truth, and to challenge those who do not. Science has always been our country's driving force, and now, a moment of desperation and global danger, is not the time for that to change. At this time, we will present the diplomas to the class of 2023. Brandon Michael Sims Allen. Alexis Marie Andrews. <laughs> Riley Ann Andrews. <laughs> Jordan Alejandro Arango. Kayla Elizabeth Archery. <laughs> Caroline Elizabeth Barber. <laughs> Linus Daniel Barnes. <laughs> Mia Kelly Bear. Maria Fazio. <laughs> Catherine Summers Bushy. <laughs> Sage Gabriel Cagle.
Kwezing on Kese. Brandon Michael Chaja. Adriana Rose Chicatelli. Henry Samantha Kulbeck. Mackenzie Rose Courtney. Kaylin Margaret Cunningham. Elise Isabella Blake Colbrand. Ariana Kathleen Dahoney. Kaya Varga Davis. August William Decker. James Richard Damaris. Lily Emma Dolan. <laughs> Lindsay Marie Drizzley. <laughs> Theodora Lauren Galvin. Zoe Marie Gillette. Yeah! Zoe B. Greenbaum. Yeah! Talia Diana Wallon. Hillary Elizabeth Wink. <laughs> Ella Mary Hewings. <laughs> Odin William Knudsen. <laughs> Carter John Watts. Logan Douglas Lockwood. <laughs> Leslie Lopez Santiago. <laughs> Carlos Manuel Lopez Santiago. Green Cruz Rashad Erdogan. <laughs> Wesley Blade Lucas. Tex Margo Marcus. <laughs> Spencer Allen Margo.
Gregory Joseph Mondo. Mago Maliro Josephine Minton. Billy Anna Nigel. Ava Alexis Nason. Aaron Tristan Oyamadel. Natalie Austin Palmer. Elizabeth Jean Petkovich. Kaylin Grace Piscitell. <laughs> Gavin Michael Quigley. Lauren Elizabeth Ralph. John Murray Ruiz. Harold Phillips.
Octave Olivia Wilson. Devante Roland Wright. Ada Young. Maggie Zane. Lila May Klein. <laughs> Lee Dill Medivis. <laughs> With great honor, Melody Lapidata. The greatest honor, Sylvie Elizabeth Cody. At this time, I would like to invite Lily Mendez, President of the Class of 2023, to the podium to administer the oath of the Athenian Youth. For the class of 2023, please rise. We will never bring disgrace on this, our community. By any act of dishonesty or cowardice. By any act of dishonesty or cowardice. We will fight for the ideals and sacred things of the community. We will fight for the ideals and sacred things of the community. Both alone and with many. Both alone and with many. We will revere and obey the community's laws. We will revere and obey the community's laws. And will do our best to incite a like reverence and respect. In those above us who are prone to annul them, or set them at naught, we will strive increasingly to quicken the public sense of civic duty. Thus, in all these, we will transmit this community not only not less, but greater, better. And more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. And more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. At this time, will the class of 2023 please move your tassels? <laughs> please be seated. Thank you. Good sportsmanship medals are awarded for participation, academic excellence, cooperation, and coachability in varsity sports and related activities. This year, the awards go to Zoe Gillette and August Egger.
which citizenship medals are awarded to the girl and boy in the senior class who, by conduct and example, best exemplify the high ideals of scholarship, character, leadership, and service. This year, the awards go to Melody Montagata and Noah Chapman. Patricia Chamberlain began her Region 1 career in 1988, serving as principal of the Sharon Center School until 2001. She was the Region's assistant superintendent from 2001 to 2005, and then the Region 1 superintendent from 2005 until her retirement in 2017. Patricia has always had a love of and a deep appreciation for the arts. Patricia was the Region 1 arts coordinator for many years, and she fostered the development of the musical theater program at the time. She established the Grade 4 Art Today, and she volunteers her time to raise funds for music, art, and theater programs in Region 1. The Ch Chamberlain Arts Achievement Award is given in honor of Patricia Chamberlain, former principal and superintendent in Region 1. This year's recipients are Hex Marcus and Noah Shepard. Here we honor a person who exemplifies what it means to serve our Region 1 community. It means getting involved to make the community better through volunteerism, support, and commitment. This year, the Community Award of America goes to a very deserving person, Nikki Blast. Vicki Blast, the rotated native, embodies the spirit of community service and compassion. Her journey as a dedicated advocate for others began in her hometown and has extended far beyond its borders. From an early age, Vicki recognized the importance of giving back. She organizes a toy drive during the Christmas season, collecting donations to be delivered to the Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and she actively participates in the charity walk every spring, raising funds to support the hospital's vital work. Vicki's commitment to community service has led her to become a club Cub Scout leader and Cub Master for the Norcanus Scouts. And in this role, she instilled the values of social responsibility and awareness in the young Scouts while forging strong connections with both the children and their families. As an advocate for youth development, Nikki dedicated over 15 years of her life to coaching in the North Canyon Youth Soccer Program, the Canyon Youth Basketball Program, and later the president and coach for the North Canyon Little League. That's all. <laughs> I had to cut out some stuff here. Nikki's love for the North Canyon community manifested in her tenure as the president of the North Canyon PTO, spanning over 11 years. She spearheaded numerous outstanding programs that made a positive impact on the lives of the school's children. From movie nights and middle school dances to magic shows and trips to baseball games, Nikki ensured that fun and engagement were at the forefront of every initiative. Nikki's altruistic nature reached beyond her immediate community. She played an integral role in organizing food and supply chains, dispatching tractor-trailer trucks to New Jersey in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. During a particularly challenging time, Nikki's support extended to close friends in the Merrill family as their son Patrick battled acute myeloid leukemia. Nikki organized a GoFundMe campaign to assist with their daily expenses and rallied the entire community for a pasta fundraiser. T-shirt sales, raffles, giveaways, and a delicious meal were all part of this incredible effort to provide support and relief during a difficult journey. Nikki's dedication to community service has benefited to comics specifically. She tirelessly lends her support to organizations such as the HBRHS Travel Club, the HBRHS Drama Society, the Class of 2023, and Project Graduation. Her unwavering commitment to these causes ensured that resources were available and support was given whenever and wherever it was needed. In every respect of her life, Nikki Blass epitomizes the true spirit of selflessness and community service. Her unwavering dedication to making a difference in the lives of others has left an indelible mark on the North Canyon community and beyond. Nikki's kindness, generosity, and leadership continue to inspire those fortunate enough to know her, making her a true role model for all, and a fitting recipient of our Community Award of Merit.
And now, will everyone please rise and join us in singing America the Beautiful. Here. We are moving right to the recessional. Before we do that, I would like to remind our audience to please remain in your rows until all of the dignitaries, students, and faculty have left the so. facility.